I'm sure this is working. There it is. All right. So uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for our time together uh, as such as it is. I pray that you would help us to continue to be able to use uh, not being in person and yet being together, uh, learning the word of God. I pray that you would help us to use this effectively and efficiently. I pray that you would help us to continue to understand and gather and appreciate the things expressed by real people about their struggles and their walks in life. And Father, to uh, be willing to adopt those things, that we would ourselves uh, become much more authentic in how we interact with you, but also, Father, with how we interact with others. And Father, uh, use these things to teach us and to train our minds to discover truth and to understand you better. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we had the homework assignment of coming up with some imagery. Uh, we used a psalm last week to see how important it is to use imagery. Uh, and it was a psalm of confidence. What psalm was that? The one that we spent the majority of our time in. We finished class in last week. Psalm 23. Psalm 23, good. And it starts with what imagery, or it has in it what imagery? Shepherd. Okay, good. Shepherd and sheep. So then I challenged you to come up with an imagery uh, that you could use to express your confidence in God and to hopefully come up with two ways that that, that pictorial way of teaching or, or expressing uh, two ways that you could use that to talk about the confidence that you have in God or the confidence you have uh, that he'll do what he says he'll do, whatever flavor it is that, that you tackled. So who would like to share what they came up with? I was going to say good morning, Dan. You look like you're either really asleep or uh, you've got allergies, one or the other. All right, who wants to share their imagery? Dan will. Go for it, man. Honey, delight and joy. Oh. And rock is okay, so honey and a rock. That's good. So, so two, he, he's a, he must be a tactile learner. He's got uh, those. Okay, good. All right, somebody else. Well, I thought PJ looked like he was getting ready to go, so he, he's still thinking about it, so I'll go ahead and go. Uh, my imagery is, is that shadow of the valley, uh, that shadow in the valley of the death, uh, that we know uh, darkness isn't a power into itself, it's the lack of light. We know that God is, is the source of all light, so we, we see that that shadow uh, is being cast through that dark spell that the psalmist is going through, that that light is still there, uh, and we have that confidence to know that that somewhere in the in that valley that we'll come out of that darkness or that shadow, not the darkness, we'll come out. That God is always with us uh, through those those times that we go through those shadows. So uh, we have that confidence. That's cool. That's deep, man. He's getting into light and shadow and shading and. <laughs> All right, somebody else. Kinda, I don't know if I did it correctly, but uh, my tree stand. Oh. Kind of, <laughs> I took I a different know. aspect to it. Um, but uh, tree stand gives me vision. You know, it sets me above and gives me vision, things that I normally wouldn't be able to see um, on the ground. So God is my vision, but also my quiet place. You know where I'm just out there in the stillness, um, and so that's how I took it. That's good. Any of you that have ever uh, now, uh, any of you that have ever climbed up in a tree stand and taken a nap? <laughs> that's what he means. That's good, man. All right, somebody else. One more. I had one. I had one, but I wrote it out more. That's all right. All right. They do their their job well, searching the fields back and forth, to and fro. They miss not a speck of scent in their search. And then at last, their quarry is found. Their quarry is found. Must stop. 
Now they must wait on the master to make the hunt a success. Without him, they go home empty-handed. Nothing to add to the table. We, like they, must wait on the master to make our efforts a success. Without him, no one is added to his table. Is that what we're looking for? Very cool. Yeah, that's great. That's uh, That would be using hunting dogs and the, the trainer. I, what, right, right. Master, is that the name of the guy that runs the dog? Exactly. Okay. Not master, whatever. Their master, put that way. Yeah. All right. Yeah, using him for the imagery for God. That's awesome. Good deal. I used fire, so that was that was mine. I came up with some things around fire. So a little, little pyro, huh? Yep. <laughs> Not burning tires, man. Nice little fireplace fire. That's... Oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> I'm, I'm EPA compliant, so mm. there we go. All right, good. So uh, there is a, a great deal of expression that we can use, that we can convey, again, without just coming right out and saying it. And sometimes we feel like that's the best way to communicate is just come up with a statement and make it. But if we're trying to convey more than just fact, sometimes an image is an excellent way to uh, express our confidence in God or to teach other things. In fact, Jesus often used imagery and he used agricultural and, and nature examples to convey thoughts and points and ideas. So one thing to remember if you're doing this is, uh, and you can see this in a lot of teaching, specifically in the life of Christ, when he tried to convey something about the spiritual world, he would often start with something that people were very familiar with in the physical world, and then he would make the connection over to the spiritual world using that thing they knew and they were familiar with. So he would start with something that they knew in order to move them over to something in the spiritual world that they didn't already know. Uh, so it, whether you're teaching kids or talking to a friend or teaching a class, uh, that'd be a great teaching point for you to remember communication point. All right, so let's review our hymns or our, our psalms. Our first one is a hymn. That's that kind of pinnacle. We're just celebrating God here. We're joyful in the Lord. And we're celebrating God together. Then the lament, and that was moving from that mountain high to the, the valley low. That's the, wow, I'm overwhelmed with life or an enemy or the circumstance, and I just don't know if I can make it. And, and God, where are you? Then moving into the Thanksgiving song which was often an expression of appreciation for God, but specifically connected to a lament. Whether it's published in the scriptures or not, a time where they went to God with a lament, God answered, and so they responded by writing a psalm of thanksgiving. And then last week we looked at a psalm of confidence. And this is not so much about structure or what comes first and second and third, as much as whatever's there, it's just covered all the way through with I know that God will take care of me. I know that God will do this. And of course, that took us to Psalm chapter 23, and the Lord is my shepherd. So today we want to look at Psalms of Remembrance. A Psalm of Remembrance. A Psalm of Remembrance is uh, similar to a Thanksgiving Psalm in that it is expressing appreciation for God. It is similar to a confidence psalm in that it's saying, hey, I can rest sure in this thing that God did. But it's a little bit different because when we move into a psalm of remembrance, it's the people of God calling to memory a specific great act of redemption that God has performed for them. So let's go into the scriptures and let's see what are the great acts of redemption that God did that the writers of the Psalms wrote about? Now, when I say redemption, and I say a great act of redemption, for us as a New Testament Christian, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Resurrection. What is it? I'm sorry? Resurrection. Yeah, the resurrection. Jesus creating for us the possibility of salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection. And then the time that we repented of our sins 
and join in with God's family through what Jesus did, that great act of redeeming us from our sins. So here's a kind of a give me question, but can the psalmist write about Jesus redeeming them from their sins? Um, yes. I think we got two different answers. <laughs> okay, so the Old Testament person could write about Jesus having finished a work at the cross for them. No. Okay. All right. So they, they could write about the Messiah, but if it's a psalm of remembrance, are they yet going to be able to remember the Messiah? No. Okay. So this is one of those points where we have to remember we're talking about Old Testament Israelites. And while there is a connection between them writing about redemption and us celebrating our redemption, they're not going to be the exact same thing. So it's not that it's a problem to connect Jesus to these things. It's that we have to be careful to remember that that's not what they were writing about. All right, so as we do look at them, what would have been their acts of redemption? Let's turn to Psalm chapter 89. Psalm chapter 89. Psalm 89 is rather long. Uh, Ava, would you like to read that? No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's, it's pretty long, so we're not going to read the whole thing just because I want us to go to, to several different psalms and see it. So I'm going to have us read a couple of just sections, but I think that as we read it, you'll, you'll probably key in here. Now be careful that you don't have something in your mind that you're trying to force onto it. Be open and, and let just, just see what the scripture talks about. Okay, Psalm 89, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll jump to some others, and I'll tell you when we move to them where we're going. Psalm 89, 1 through 4, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Now we're going to skip down to verse 19 and read through verse 37. Psalm 89, starting verse 19. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established. Also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. Also I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn the highest of the kings of the earth. His mercy I will keep for him forever. And my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. And then down to verse 49 through the end of the chapter, just a couple of verses. Lord, where are your former loving kindnesses? which you swore to David in your truth. Remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples, with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. All right, so what does the psalmist hit several times through here as a great, wonderful, epic, memorable act of redemption.
the, the promises made to their uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Okay. Now, did you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in here? No, but. Who did you see? All generations. All generations and David. Okay. David specifically. So one of the things to remember is in the Old Testament, we get to look back now and we get to see cumulatively the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Moses, and, and all these people. And we get to see them all kind of packaged together. Yeah. Jeff, remember back then, they didn't have that. Abraham only had what Abraham had. And it was kind of vague. And then God got a little more specific. And then as the years went on, he got a little more specific with each one. So we have the um, Noahic covenant or the, the Adamic covenant with Adam and then the Noahic covenant with Noah, where he said, I promise I'll never destroy the earth again. And then we have the Abrahamic covenant. And then though we have with David, we have the Davidic covenant where God says to David, what? What is the great promise that God says unconditionally, I will do this for you, David? Okay, that, that's just for David. What did God promise would continue on even long after David was dead? His line, his bloodline. Yeah, his bloodline, and specifically that his bloodline would do what? It would be the church. It would be the, the, uh, the chosen, not the chosen one, but it would, bring, it would bring about the redemption through his bloodline. Right, no, you were right. The redemption. bloodline would be the chosen one. God promises that the Messiah will come from David. Now, that's, that's a little bit vague that the Messiah would come from David here. But what God does say is, he says, David, I promise that your throne will be established forever. And he's not figuratively speaking. He's literal there. And he says, even if your sons walk away from me, I'll punish them, but I'm not going to take your throne away. Your throne will continue as the king of Israel forever. So, now that we are 2,000, 3,000 years later, we know that means Jesus, a descendant of David, was the Messiah and will come and sit on the throne of the earth one day. So David maybe didn't have all those details, but we have an, a, an absolute unconditional covenant with David that his throne, him reigning over Israel, would be established and would continue forever. That is a massive piece of the Old Testament puzzle and understanding how God is working through his servants at different times. So in Psalm 89, we see the great redemptive act that David was established as the king of Israel forever. Now that's not just because David wrote a bunch of the Psalms. It's because Israel gets a great promise from that. Israel gets the promise that they're forever going to have a king, that he's going to be of a good lineage. I mean, nobody wants a king out of Jezebel and Ahab's line, uh, but they get one out of David's line, the, the good king, and Solomon, his son, the good king. And so they get that promise. So there's a lot for Israel to hang on to here, especially as they go into trouble sometimes, that no matter what happens, eventually God's going to bring Israel back and put a throne with David on it, or David's descendant on it. All right, so Psalm 89 gives us David's unconditional covenant. Uh, on the throne. Let's turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, we'll read verses 12 through, oh, uh, we'll go through 31. They're short verses. We'll be all right. All right, so here again, we're looking for a particular act, a particular time where God did something fantastic and big and epic, and it was an act of redemption. And this is what is going to be one of the, the few themes of all the Psalms of remembrance. Psalm 78, we'll start in verse 12. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers. So he's talking about in the sight of the fathers of the children of Israel, like what their parents saw. In the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan, he divided the sea and caused them to pass through. And he made the waters stand up like a heap. In the daytime, he also led them with the cloud and all night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. 
but they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore, the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he had commanded the clouds above and he opened the doors of heaven and rained down manna on them to eat and gave them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels food. He sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power, he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas and he let them fall in the midst of their camp. So all around their dwelling, so they ate and were filled for he gave them their own desire they were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. Now, now don't read into this at this point anyway, the negativity about it. Let's just talk about what major event did these things go with? The deliverance. Yeah. Okay, the deliverance of the, the Exodus. We've got the Red Sea crossing and miraculous manna and water and meat provision in the wilderness. Now, unfortunately, we also have to read about how they whined and complained and God had to smack them around a little bit and give them a few spankings and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, not that those are equivalent, by the way. And, and yet we see that this great point of remembrance was the Exodus which really for the Old Testament picture of things is the picture in the Old Testament of salvation for the New Testament believer. It was through the death of the firstborn and through the death of the lamb and the blood that was shed that God's people were ushered out of slavery to a foreign king, a foreign God, and brought into freedom and to the promised land beautiful picture of the process and the pieces of salvation. So when we see the great acts of redemption in Psalms of Remembrance, it's probably going to be these two, David on the throne and the Exodus from Egypt. Now, it may be the things connected to the Exodus. It may be the things connected to David on the throne, uh, but these are pretty much going to be what we find and, and what we see in the Psalms of Remembrance. It doesn't mean there can't be something else sprinkled in through the Psalms somewhere, but most all of them are about these two themes. All right, so what particular promptings do these remembrances come with? Because uh, we've been talking here at the church recently, and, and hopefully it's something that we all get settled in our mind. Remembering what God has done is not just so that I can, oh, remember what God did. That's some good information. Uh, as we were parenting, our, our children had to learn how to express things beyond just information. Now, I don't know if you have little children in your home or not, but often one of our children would come up and say, Mommy, I'm thirsty. That's good information. Thank you for sharing. What's the problem with them coming up and just saying, I'm thirsty? Not asking. Yeah, they're, they're not asking for anything. They're just telling us they're thirsty. That's information they've communicated, but there's no response to that. There's no follow-up. There's no action that they have asked from us. And so they would often walk up and they would give us a bit of information. And we'd look at them and nod and say, thank you for sharing that information. And, and they would kind of look at us for a minute. And then after a couple of times, they started learning, oh yeah, I got to ask for something here. And so then they would have to think through, okay, what is it that I want? And, and then they would learn to ask for the response. They would look for the action that would follow up. Well, when we go to the scripture, it's very similar. God doesn't give us information just so that we can go, well, that's good information. No, he gives us information so that there's follow-up. He gives us something so that we can respond to it. There's an action that God is looking for as we get that information from him. So when the writer of Psalms wrote about these great acts of redemption in the past, what response did that prompt him to? What response did that prompt the Old Testament Israelite to? So let's go look at a couple of these. 
Let's go and look. We're already in Psalm 78, so we'll look at Psalm 78. Somebody read verses 1 through 8 for us, and I want you to pay attention what particular acts of, of follow-up or response, what particular behaviors are prompted in the mind of the psalmist because of the great act of remembrance they're getting ready to write about. All right, who wants to read that for us? Can you come up here? Okay. She's going to come up here so that she's close enough you can hear. All right, Psalm 78, 1 through 8. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our from, excuse me, we will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rebecca. All right. So what were some particular responses that the psalmist said, look, this is what I and this is what we need to do because of the Exodus. We need to tell you from each generation. Yeah, we need to tell it to the next generation. Good. What else? Keep the commandments to not forget. Ah, yes. The thing God's done. It's not just so that they will know the commandments. We need to tell them so that we can keep them and they can keep them. All right, good. What else? There's kind of three particulars there in verse 7 that go with keeping his commandments. It starts by saying what? We're going to put... We're going to put our hope in God. We're going to choose to make him the object of our faith. And, yeah, and not forget his works. There's a difference between hearing information and logging it in as something we keep on the kind of the forefront of our mind all the time. We can hear it and then forget it. But he says here, we're going to not forget the works of God. Now, he says, not only do we need to tell the next generation, but why do we need to tell the next generation, according to the end of verse 5? What else do we need to see happen? So that they stay with God and don't set their hearts against him. Okay. And, in, and what are they eventually going to do if that's how they live? Teach their children. Yeah. So we're talking about not just kids, but grandkids here. It's important that we disciple our children, but not just that we train them to follow God. We train them to follow God by making sure they teach their children. All right, good. So you can see there's some particular responses that the psalmist calls for as we think about that great act of redemption. What should it do to change our lives? All right, let's go to Psalm, uh, Psalm 89. We were there earlier looking at David being on the throne. Let's go back there and see what he might have, uh, this writer might have ushered as a, a part of that remembrance. Psalm 89, uh, we'll just read verses 1 and 2. He says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. All right, so what, what two things does he say, this ought to be our response when we remember this thing? Hey, he says, sing to the Lord, right? I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. 
Not just, hey, you know, thanks God, I'll sing you a little ditty here and then we'll be done. No, no, no. He says, this will be my way of life that I will sing to the Lord. This will be my constant lifestyle and attitude toward God. Good. What else? We'll make his faithfulness known. Yeah. To, the to all generations here again. The idea of this happened in the past, I need to make sure I communicate it to the next generation. Now, this is a really good point for us as parents and as disciples to remember. It's not just good enough to, to tell our kids information about God. It's not good enough for us to just make sure that they're in a, a Bible study somewhere that they get you know, the, the stories of the Old Testament. We need to tell our children specifically the ways that God has done great things in our life. One of the best memories that I have of this uh, is when my mom sat down with me one day and she said, you know, you're getting old enough that, you, that you're managing your own money and I, and I want you to see this. And she didn't show me all the details, but she walked me through how uh, in the checkbook, the numbers didn't add up to being enough to tithe and pay all the bills that were due. But my parents went ahead and wrote their giving check anyway, step of faith, and how somehow at the end of the month, there was enough money and everything cleared and there was a little bit of money left over. She said, I don't know how it happened. The numbers don't work, but God's been faithful because we've been faithful with our finances. Uh, and, and it was a specific example and my parents taking me and showing me, look, this is how God has done great things in our life. It wasn't just, you know, in the Bible, God says a tithe, you know, if you, if you give, God says he'll be faithful to you. We need to teach that, but we need to share the specifics of our lives with our children and our spiritual children, those who we are discipling. All right, let's turn over to 105, Psalm 105, just a few pages over in your Bible, probably. I want to volunteer to read Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Out loud. Okay, thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works, which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Good. Thank you, Ms. Brenna. All right, so what are some particular acts and responses that we ought to have according to this psalm? Again, we're supposed to sing to him and to tell of all his wonderful works. All right, good. Singing to him, telling of his wonderful works. All right, anything else in there? Give thanks for the name. Okay, yeah, giving thanks. That goes back to our psalm of thanksgiving. Sometimes God answers our prayers, and we just kind of go on about our business like nothing changed. No, we need to stop and give thanks. All right, good. Yeah, there in verse 4, seek his face forevermore. Seek the Lord and his strength. God did this in the past. Why would we turn away from this path? Let's stay on this path. Uh, one of the things that I, I encourage young Christians about or, or Christians that are in a time of, of great trial of their faith is that God doesn't take us from zero faith to a whole lot of faith in, in a big you know, jump. It's like a muscle. God gives us a little bit of something to challenge us that's a little stronger than what we think we can handle. And so when we put our faith in him and he brings us through it, our faith gets a little bigger. And then the next time the faith challenge comes, well, now it's got to be bigger because our faith is bigger. And so that time it strengthens it and builds it a little more. Well, guess what? The next test of our faith, it's going to be bigger yet. And it gets bigger again. And God doesn't give us the test that's this big when our faith is this big. He gives us something that grows it so that we can handle the thing that's coming next as we're putting our faith in him. Doesn't mean we can handle it on our own. I believe scripture teaches God gives us more than what we can handle on our own, but he does it on purpose and it's to grow our faith in him. So seek the Lord. Good. Uh, let's see. Right in, uh, there was one more. Remembers another one. Yes. Um, 
if you remember when they crossed the river, they had standing stones. They built standing stones. This is, I think, we need to do that with our own lives. When, when God's done something big for us, let's get standing stones up to remember it. That's good. Setting up things of remembrance. Good. We need to actively make sure that we're going back and remembering these things. All right. Good. Let's on, turn to Psalm 135. All right, Psalm 135, verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. All right. What does the psalmist write ought to be our response here? Praise. Yeah, to praise the Lord. Like one time and be done, right? Yeah, did you notice that? He's like, praise the Lord. I'm going to say it a different way. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm going to say it again. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord. He just keeps coming back to, hey, we can't do this enough. We need to always be praising the Lord. I wonder how often this is an evidence of our mindset that we, we pay attention to God on Sunday and we shift gears and we don't really talk about him the rest of the week. Or, or we, we deal with God when we're with Christians, but we kind of forget about God when we're with unsaved people. Is it okay for us to say, man, God's been so good to me when we're talking to the cashier at the store and we have no idea if she's saved or not? Well, sure, this doesn't say praise the Lord as long as you're standing in the temple or praise the Lord as long as you're inside the tabernacle. No, it, it's, it's, there is a lifestyle here. But are we going to praise the Lord just because we're weird and we want to draw attention to ourselves? Hopefully not. It's a praising God because there is a remembrance. There's a constant mindfulness of what he's done for us. Now, we're not going to read all the way through Psalm 136, but I want to read just a couple so you can see how there's a, uh, a repetition. Uh, we talked about how sometimes the structure that's used is just a constant repetition to get our attention. Uh, Psalm 136, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. So we have kind of capsulized here in this one verse, the idea of a psalm of remembrance. For the Lord is good, our response is to give thanks to the Lord. So then he goes on, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. And that process of naming something and then his mercy endures forever comes back again and again and again. Now, that may seem like just a, well, they needed something to fill in, so they just kept saying, for his mercy endures forever. But again, if we make the connection the correlation between the Old Testament redemption and the New Testament redemption, couldn't we easily write a psalm that says, you know what, I'll be content because God saved me through the blood of Jesus. I'll rejoice because God saved me through the blood of Jesus. I'll be sacrificial because God saved me through the blood of Jesus. Couldn't we come back and say his mercy endures forever? I have been giving un, given unending grace in Jesus, and therefore my entire life will be a response to that. Could, couldn't that very well be what we write instead of what this psalmist wrote in Psalm 136? And that's what he's saying for the Old Testament believer, the Old Testament uh, God follower is his mercy endures forever. He didn't know what all that looked like yet, but he knew that God promised to deal with man's sin problem. He knew that God promised a redeemer. He knew that God promised a redemption, and he based his entire life on that. And we very much should do the same thing in our lives. So that's an, an example of how this could be the basis of everything that we say and everything that we do. It's all a response to his redemption. 
Does that make sense? Do you see that in that Psalm? Sometimes I study these things and they're really clear, but I'm not sure if anybody else is going to get them or not. Okay. All right. So what would be a New Testament or a modern day, not, not just New Testament, but a modern day version of a song that says we need to remember all the good things that God has done for us. And because of that, we should respond. Anybody think of one? Maybe a song that you know we've sung in, in church, or maybe you sang in church as a kid, or you've heard of in church. Jesus, thank you. Okay, Jesus, thank you. Good. Uh, 10,000 reasons, as I would say. Okay. Any others? I don't know so much a song, but what about communion? Isn't that why we take communion? To remember what he's done? Yeah. To look at yeah, the past and the future? Right. Specifically, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, his mercy is more. We're going to be singing that in, in service today. All right, Mr. Becker, would you come up and help me lead this one? Uh, how about the good old hymn, Count Your Blessings? Yeah, I mean, it specifically says in the song, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, do what? Remember, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. And then the verses, are you ever burdened with a load of care? When you look at others with their lands and gold. So then the conclusion, so amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. So th this song follows right in the pattern of the Psalm of Remembrance. So uh, we're going to sing just the first verse. Uh, again, it says, When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed. Now, if you've got your hymn book there at the house, we encourage you to take home. Uh, a while back, you can go grab it. It's number 563. Or we're just going to sing the first verse if you want to hum along and then join in. Uh, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you is what this one says what the lord has done now because we're on different timings i'm gonna to have to mute everybody otherwise we'll have 97 versions of count your many blessings going through so we'll sing here the finnans are here to help and uh, then when we get done with that we will conclude our class all right here we go when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. All right, good job. I'm sure that you were beautiful and your voices were pleasing to the Lord. Uh, some of you, that's why we muted you. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but hopefully, seriously, you, you did sing there. And I would encourage you this week, here's your homework, to write a very short or write the outline points for a psalm of remembrance. Now, if you want to pick specifically a uh, particular act of redemption, like, uh, and I would encourage you to do a, a, a massive one, like you had a, a near-death experience and, and God saved your, your physical life, or uh, at your salvation testimony, or maybe you don't write specifically about your salvation testimony particular to you. You write about God's work at the cross to offer redemption. Um, but let's bring those in as the base main remembrance point. But then if you want to add other things that God's been doing recently, that's awesome because that's a response to that is to remember the other things that God has done. Uh, and don't forget to, to put in there, what's our response going to be? either call for a response of other Christians because of God's faithfulness, 
or talk about maybe what your response is going to be or is because of what God has done in being good to you and in saving you and in redeeming us as believers. All right, so that's your homework. And then next week, we will get on to our, I think, next to last week of class. Let's see, yes. 30th. And then, yeah, yeah, next week, next to last week of class. So if you have a Psalm question, if you have a particular question about either Psalms in general or a particular thing in the book of Psalms, please let me know what that is. I'll do my best to, to make time for us to answer that in class. If I can't make time for us to answer it in class, I'll do my best to help you find an answer just for you. All right. Before, before you go, yes, what were the what were the blanks in the top? Oh. Yeah, on the paper. Remembrance it was God's past acts of redemption, right? Let me get a handout, please. All right. Yes. Aha. Okay. Uh, God's past acts of. Let me find where we're at in our notes. I'll give you the exact right answer. Um, of redemption, God's past acts of redemption are the focus. These past acts of redemption are typically for the nation of Israel as a whole. So that second blank, the middle one, is the nation of Israel. And their remembrance has a prompt for our response to these memories. Thank you. Redemption, nation of Israel, and response. I apologize for that. I forgot those were blanks up in there. I was thinking you guys had all just read that and you were ready to go. Uh, but thank you for pausing and asking that so we can get that filled in. I know some of these people would have been twitching for the rest of the day without their blanks filled in. So that's cool. All right. Thank you, folks. Lord willing, we'll see you in service in just a little bit.